welcome to the brand new start of Central. I'm Nantara Rai, the only show of its kind on Indian television dedicated to startups, entrepreneurship, technology, innovation, disruption. Anything that has to do with the new economy is right here on weekdays. 60 minutes packed show. Uh, we come to you from 6 to 7 p.m. Stay in touch with us. Uh, send us emails. Our address is on your screens right on top. Start of Central at etnr.tv. I'm also on Twitter. Stay in touch, folks. Tell us what you want to see on the show, what you never want to see on the show. Pitch to us. Maybe you'll even be a part of the show one day. We were just talking about disruption. Now, there was certainly one disruption in India, thanks to the government, and that was Aadhaar, our unique identity. And its chief architect, Nandan Nilekani, is back with a new platform, which is called Semati. What is Semati, you will ask me? Well, Semati is an account aggregator. Allows users to share financial data digitally with third parties in secure manner. The work around this began actually a few years back and it's got the permission from all the regulators. The Reserve Bank of India, the market regulator SEBI, the insurance regulator, the pension regulator PFRDA and that is to share all of the user content, your content securely. How's it going to work? If someone wants a loan from a bank, he or she can quickly share his bank statements and other details digitally via their choice of a preferred account aggregator. Which in a sense means that uh, it's going to eliminate the need for individuals to physically visit multiple branches with their data, share confidential login ID details. How many times have you all have had to go from bank branch to bank branch and say this is the Aadhaar copy, this is my PAN data, this is my driver's license, uh, these are my bank accounts, you know all of that, forget it. All in one place through a safe account, the account aggregator will not be able to read your data. But you know what, why am I going on explaining it to you? Here's the man himself, it's his brainchild, he's done all the work, here's Nandan Nilakini with Semati. How do we make people leverage their own data? Because we have been saying for some time now that India, Indians are going to be data rich before they're economically rich. You know, we know that when the West brought in computers and digitization or the internet last 20 years, they were already economically rich. And because they were economically rich, data became a way to sell to them. So you could sell ads to them and that's how we saw these big revenues from advertising and so on. But Indians are going to be data rich before they are economically well off. In other words, somebody in India, in Bihar is using a smartphone, his or her digital footprint is as, as comprehensive as that of a person in Boston using a smartphone. If you have a small business in India which is using an accounting package which is filing its GST returns, which is paying its income tax, which is taking digital payments, their digital footprint is as, uh, as exhaustive, as, as rich as somebody who runs a store in, in, in San Francisco. However, the individuals and the companies here are not at the same income level. So the whole idea of what we are trying to do here, and Sudarshan was a part of that, Sudarshan Sen was closely involved uh, when we worked with them at the RBI, uh, is how do we get people to use their own data to advance their life? How can they use the data to get better healthcare, better education, better loans, and so on? And therefore, this, this model that we have suits a country where people are, have data but haven't got the benefits of the data, and therefore, if they have access to their own data, they can use it for the future. So, in the account aggregator design, and uh, maybe I'll walk around, yeah, that's okay with you. So this is the broad sort of architecture of this. At, at one end, we have sources of data, which in the parlance of this is called as financial information providers. In other words, they have, they have data on businesses or individuals, could be banks, mutual funds, insurance providers, and tax and the GST platform. And these are very important because they are, have data which is digitally there, which is either about individuals or businesses. And on the other side, we have what we're calling as financial information users. And they could be lenders, they could be 
finance management tools, wealth management tools, robo advisors, you know, this is up to the innovation of people to think about different ways to do that. But we think over time more and more solutions will come. And we have individuals or small businesses who want to take the data, unlock it from these sources and give it under very structured conditions with their own consent to these users. That's the whole idea. Now what's important is that this brings together multiple concepts. The first concept is how do we create an electronic consent? How do we, how do we have a strong way of saying this person is the person and this person is requesting for his own data? And for that, there is a whole thing called electronic consent artifact. And the credit for that goes to Meti and uh, Ajay, Ajay is here. Ajay, the actually, you just stand up and introduce yourself. Ajay is the secretary of the <laughs> Ministry of IT, and they have been at the forefront of uh, many of these things, as you know, uh, many of the technology. But electronic consent artificial was launched by Meti about, uh, I think, three, three and a half years back, and that allows individuals and businesses to ask for the data in an authenticated manner, so that you know that it's. So this is a very important piece of that. And you can do that using ID or whatever, but we can do all that. Now, the other big development which happened at the level of the financial regulators was the concept of account aggregator. And account aggregator is a concept that was actually conceived by the RBI and other financial regulators. And the good news was that the account aggregator concept was done at the level of the FSDC, the Financial FSDC Council, where all the regulators sit together. So the power of this idea is that if the account aggregator framework has been approved at the level of FSDC, then all the regulators are going to use it. So today, it will be used by RBI, it will be used by SEBI and Madhvi is here, uh, IRDA and PFRD. So in one stroke, all financial regulators will use that. that that's the power of this leapfrog. And when we went to, I remember we had a meeting as iSpirit with uh, the RBI. At that time, Raghu was there and uh, we, Mr. Vishwanathan was there and so on. And we talked about the need to create this data empowerment. How do we empower? And the idea came from Mr. Vishwanathan. He said, why don't we use the account aggregator framework? He said, we had not even heard of that at that time. And he put this idea to us and he said, it's approved at the FSDC level, so we'll get automatically all four regulators. So he, he, he was the person who really brought us onto this uh, thing. And then, therefore, later on, therefore, working with the regulators and essentially taking a concept but making it more digital in some senses, you know, the value add that iSpirit did. And so this is now a approved category of account aggregators. So account aggregators are regulated entities. So they are a non, it's a form of a NBFC. And therefore, they get, get regulated and they get approval to operate from RBI. RBI is the operating regulator for this concept. So when they do it, it applies to all the four regulators. And already, I think, seven firms, I think many of them are here, have already got in principle approval for being account uh, uh, aggregators. Already the, the, you know, the ship has left. Now, the way it works is that I, as a consumer, I could be an individual or a small business, request the account aggregator to get my, say, banking data or my GST data and give it to a lender, as a simple example. The good news is this is all done through APIs. So there's no screen, screen scraping and, you know, give me your password, all that, none of that stuff. It's all based on APIs. And the account ag ag aggregator by regulation does not see the data. This is very important. It is taking encrypted data from here to here. So they cannot see the data, they cannot leverage the data in any way. And therefore the account aggregator is incentive aligned with the user. Unlike in the internet world where they're collecting data about you, the account aggregator by, law, by regulation can only pass data and he has to make money from transactions or whatever. And so there is the flow of data like this from here to here. And the other important thing is the electronic consent 
and again India is the only country in the world where the electronic consent is a programmable consent. You can say, I will give you this data, but you can use it only once. Or you can say, this data expires in one week. So you can actually, on your consent, you can put stipulations which apply to the user of this. So it's, it's very sophisticated in, in not only the fact that we have a consent architecture, we have a way of defining the consent in a programmable way. And this is designed for a billion people. So a billion people can use this infrastructure. It can be used by all the 11 million businesses who are there in GST and so on. So this is real-time consented sharing of financial information. And later on, you'll hear from my friend Prakash Kumar, the CEO of GSTN, on how GSTN hopes to participate in this. And I think many of our, all our banks are here, and I think Mr. Rajesh Kumar and others will speak about it. So everybody will join, and a bank will both be a user as well as a provider. So if a bank wants to give a loan, it's a user. If on the other hand, a consumer wants to get some data from a bank, he's a provider. And ultimately, more and more financial information providers will plug into this using standard APIs. So now you may get the GST data, which is indirect tax. You may get tomorrow, you made the income tax data, which is direct tax. Day after tomorrow, you may get the MCA data. So over time, you'll plug in more and more of these providers. So richer and richer data possibilities emerge, which I can then share with whatever user I have. Similarly, it could be other. For example, there's a whole business of first time mobile users getting credit based on their mobile usage pattern or their recharge pattern. So the TRAI will then have the telecom guys giving data into this. So you know, this is really going to become, a, it's a extendable on this side with newer and newer providers. It's extendable on this side with newer and newer users. And you will have multiple account aggregators competing in the market under a re regulated umbrella of the FSDC. So it's really a very, very, uh, very, very elegant solution. But the solution has come about because of government, regulators, technology, public interest technology people, banks, data providers, all working together to create this thing. So it, it took us you know, several years to put all this together, but today we have it and we'll, I think there's a demo plan later on. As I said, the account aggregator cannot read your data, cannot resell your data. So the account aggregator is fully aligned incentives with the user, be it an individual or be it a business. And an example of this, you have a small business, so Mohan wants to get a loan, he can demand his GST returns from the GSTN, his bank account data from his bank, his home loan repayment record from his HFC, and he can share that with the lender or a set of lenders, and the lenders will then use that data and make a judgment of whether he is uh, eligible for a loan, and he maybe even give him the loan decision in real time. And this will, can be done at scale. And the good news is that as India's AI and deep learning and all these techniques improve, they will use AI and machine learning and deep learning to judge whether he is a good credit risk. So suddenly, we now have an architecture which will work at scale using rich data and well-trained data models to, to enable banks and others to make credit decisions. And this is going to go to people who so far may not have been in the credit cycle because of knowledge asymmetry. So this removes the knowledge asymmetry between small, small, small companies and individuals and enables them to participate in the formal financial system. So the next cycle of growth can actually be driven by rapid adoption of this. And because it is very richly data-based, it is actually and, and you'll have, have machine learning and all that, you'll actually have much better underwriting and risk management here than we have had in the past. So it'll actually allow you to scale without all the risks of uh, doing that. And the other important thing is that this lending is not based on assets. Historically, lending is based on assets. You submit your balance sheet and your collateral. This lending is based on flow. 
on invoices, on payments, on receipts. So flow-based lending, which means companies and individuals who are not yet in the formal economy can use their income to get a loan. And this is how we are going to have financial inclusion, because you don't have to have any assets to get a loan here. You have to show that you have business, and that business is, you know, you're selling things and getting money back. And therefore, we think this has a massive role in financial inclusion, so that millions of small businesses that were not in the, in the financial system can now get access to finance. And that is also the reason why they will join the formal economy. You know, there's this whole theory that small business doesn't want to be in the formal economy because they don't want to pay taxes and this and that. But the reality is that once they join this, the benefit to them of joining the formal economy, which will be access to credit at an affordable price, becomes the incentive for them to join the system. And therefore, more companies will join, make sure they file the GST returns and, and become part of GST, because they know that they can now use that invoice details to get loans. So I think this is creating a virtuous cycle of formalization, where the incentive to formalize is not that you, know, you better join or else kind of thing, but actually because you have a way of now accessing credit and other things from the formal economy. And so we think this will create a virtuous cycle, and therefore this has huge potential going forward. And of course, as the quality of data improves, you will have much better improvement in understanding the risk. So I think it will all help in this whole NPA stuff. And most of the world's conversations today are defensive. How to protect users from somebody misusing the data. So the GDPR in Europe is all about how to protect users and so on. Here, we are taking a different view. It's not about just protection, which we, we will have. It's very well protected because your data is encrypted, signed, can only be with your consent, etc. It is how can we use data to empower users? And this is the important thing, the inversion to data as empowerment. Well, that's why this whole thing is a data empowerment architecture. And parts of this are being done. For example, in Europe, PSD2, some part of it is about this. In, in UK, open banking is part of this. Some, there's some mention of doing this in the Dodd-Frank Act in the US. But nowhere in the world is a complete system being put in at scale to make this happen, which is why it's pretty unique. Adar, you can see Nandan Nilakani has been busy with Samiti and, uh, you know, I think all of, the, all of you who sometimes go for bank loans, that's one of the biggest problems that you face. Uh, forget the paperwork and how mindless all of that sometimes feel. But just the need that uh, if you've got assets and you've got cash flow, why would you go to a bank for a loan? And that's exactly the problem Nandan Nilakani is trying to fix, saying you don't need the assets. Take the loan against the flows. Uh, this has been a big quandary even uh, uh, for self-employed uh, people, startups, uh, uh, housewives, you name it. If you've got assets and you've got cash flows, why would you ever want a loan? Is that one of the big reasons that banking, uh, banks are going through the crisis that they are? Food for thought, but as you can see, Nandan Nilakani looking to make everyone's lives easier with Semithi over there and, of course, give a big, big boost a shot to financial inclusion. What did you think of Samathy? Uh, give us your views. Uh, write in to us. Our email address is startupcentral at etnow.tv. You can also reach out to me directly on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Nantara Rai. Uh, there's Nandan Nilakani really trying to rework the entire financial space. Uh, with that, we're going to take a short commercial break. Uh, but stay tuned. We've got another special feature lined up for you on the other side. It's uh, big boy Google and its plans for early stage startups. This is something you don't want to miss out on. You're watching the brand new Startup Central with me, Nantara Rai. Stay in touch with us, folks. Tell us what you want to see on the show, what you thought of the show so far, what you never want to see on the show. Our email address is uh, startupcentral at etnow.tv. You can also stay in touch with me directly on Twitter. Now, any hurdle for early state startups and all of you entrepreneurs is access to network and a go-to-market strategy. Now, we've known for some time that... Uh, 
Google is looking for startups that are solving India-specific problems. It's a global chief, Sundar Pichai, who's of Indian origin, has been quite vociferous on that. For this Launchpad Accelerator program, Google runs specific programs for women entrepreneurs once a year. Rahul Dyama caught up with um, Paul Ravindranath of Google India to know more about how startups can best use this particular platform, this Launchpad. This is news for all of you folks that are looking for someone like Google to back you, not just with money, but with the best of expertise that's out there. Well, uh, Google has been engaging with startups here in India through their various programs. Uh, the Launchpad initiative, apart from really putting in place a larger network for mentorship, uh, they also have a dedicated uh, boot camp for women entrepreneurs, also an accelerator, accelerator really for Indian startups solving niche problems, solving for India. So what is it as a startup, as an entrepreneur that you should really look forward to from Google? What is it that you can gain out? I have with me Paul joining us from Google Launchpad to sort of give us a sense of uh, the program and their engagement uh, with startups. Paul, thank you so much for taking out the time and joining us. Uh, uh, I, I know there's a women boot camp, uh, you know, for um, entrepreneurs really. What really is the larger focus area and what is it that Google also really plans to achieve from this? Yeah. So uh, there's a two-day women-focused uh, boot camp that we're doing as part of Launchpad. And this is really our investment in long term to kind of grow the number of women entrepreneurs who are benefiting from ecosystems like accelerators and incubators. And if you really see out there, this is a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, even with Launchpad itself, number of women entrepreneurs applying uh, to get mainstream acceleration support tends to be low. And uh, with activities like this, we want to find very nice startups that are at a point of need and give them a flavor of really co-mentorship and then bring them into uh, apply to our broader programs in the ecosystem. Okay. Any specific challenges that you see, you know, women entrepreneurs really have here in India? Uh, of course, the representation of women in tech is, you know, dissimilar. Uh, number of women entrepreneurs also, uh, um, of course, that's another debate in itself. But what, what really has been the takeaway from women entrepreneurs and the gaps that can be really bridged? So the the problem, the first problem actually starts with them actually taking the initiative to apply. Often, uh, you know, men founded startups, they tend to be more, more bullish to take support from programs in the mm -hmm. ecosystem, whether they're ready or not. Uh, I've found that women entrepreneurs often nitpick about being very specific, whether I am a match for this or not, and they're not very bullish about applying. I think programs like this encourage more and more women to apply. And uh, the community matters a lot. So they are part of a broader uh, ecosystem of uh, women entrepreneurs and women mentors. And often it's a more comfortable and free environment and they tend to kind of really blossom in those. So we've learned that encouraging and creating these kind of ecosystems helps us to actually get more and more women to take support broadly. Yeah, and it's important to sort of ensure that they are part of the larger ecosystem. But what, coming to, uh, you know, Google's plan for startups, I was saying, you know, you've been engaging with Indian startups in many ways. Could you break it down for us in terms of the touch points, the level of engagements that are open to startups really in a way, uh, yeah. Yeah, so we have, uh, you know, as Launchpad, we really have three different touch points. Uh, we all know about the accelerator. We have gr had great, uh, you know, number of applicants. Uh, the accelerator is one. Secondly, we look at partners in the ecosystem and we are meaningfully look to find folks who have a founder first attitude, accelerator, incubator programs, even co-working spaces with these kind mm -hmm. of elements to help and support with Google's uh, mentorship network, our team, our resources. So that's the partner angle. And we are also looking at communities. So mm -hmm. India is thriving with startup communities. Bangalore is a great example, Delhi, Mumbai as well. And we want to kind of take all of the knowledge components that we've built over the years, workshops, boot camps, to these small community-based ecosystems as well. So apart from our own self-driven acceleration, we're looking at partners and communities. I think this is going to be our holistic kind of engagement with the ecosystem. All right. You know, I will have to focus a lot more on the accelerator program to sort of, uh, you know, send out a word to entrepreneurs. Break it down for us. Is the focus still on startups solving India-specific problems? Uh, uh, you know, are the entries open? How long are the entries open? How can startups apply? How do they know that they do sort of fall into the category? Yeah. Uh, Launchpad Accelerator is currently open for uh, our class 
last three applications. Uh, people can go to g.co slash launchpad and apply. Uh, our application window will open through August and we will be selecting a class that will begin in October this year. And October through December, we will have a support. And uh, our focus continues to remain startups that are solving for India hmm. and using cutting edge tech like AI, machine learning and other deep tech to be doing that. So we, this is kind of a theme that we have chosen and we have already 20 startups in and we will continue with that through this year. Uh, we're bringing a lot of uh, creative components to uh, the program itself. We will be, apart from our very strong India mentor network, we have a lot of uh, folks from the Israel ecosystem, which is popular for ML expertise, coming in to support the startups. We have more customized workshops to the three month period that we are offering to startups based on their needs. So we're really like uh, meeting them at their point of need in, the, in that sense and adding a lot of smaller elements to uh, meet the startup needs. Good. You know, when you say uh, solving for India is the sector agnostic so to say uh, uh, also should you be really solving for the masses uh, to sort of be eligible for the program well it really depends so every startup approaches problems in unique mm -hmm. ways uh, we only require that the startups uh, ultimate solution actually touches a real pain point uh, that is faced in India in Southeast Asia region or other area markets that are similar mm. to India. And I think uh, eventually all of these tend to be mass problems, mm. right? Mm. Uh, but startups have a unique niche. Sometimes they're only solving for a specific set of rural India, mm. but sometimes that is also applicable in, in Indonesia and in Africa. So it's not necessary that they must be a mass solution, but they must be solving a meaningful problem that we all need uh, solutions for. All right. But this program, I believe it, um, it's not Google is looking for equity in these startups. It's more a engagement. Um, an enhancement of a larger program in that sense? Yeah, so Launchpad is a completely equity-free program. Uh, we do it pro bono. Uh, the idea of Launchpad is really the attitude and intent is mm -hmm. to help the ecosystem build and grow. Uh, we choose meaningful startups and match them with the best uh, mentor network that we have built over time. These mentors are not just Google or Google employees, but they are industry experts, VCs, and others we have collected over a period of time in three or four different areas. We have a very strong tech expertise, and we have a lot of components like leadership workshops and design workshops that we have built into the program. Too. So startups who qualify for the accelerator program would, of course, have a larger leeway, a larger access to the market in terms of VCs that Google will sort of look at bridging the gaps at. Yes, so we it's an anything goes program. Mm. So startups needs, even if it is funding, is definitely met by access to our funder, funders network, to our VC network that we have. And uh, every startup has a graduation day with a demo. And uh, we invite the ecosystem at large to be part of it. And often startups do find, uh, say, somebody who is looking to fund them. And, uh, you know, we make sure that we put uh, the right people together. All right. Last couple of questions, Paul. You know, um, any two specific trends that you've seen stand out really from um, the Indian startup, tech startup ecosystem over the last few years? Is the, has the quality of startups really improved? Um, is AI, uh, machine learning really emerging as hot picks for startups looking to solve these problems? Second question first. I mm. think AI, uh, earlier every startup would just add AI component to their pitch tech. But when you dig deep, there is no real uh, AI really being used. Mm. So, but what we've seen over time is uh, over the last three batches, uh, we have actually seen a uh, very strong use of AI. And th that's also because there is a longer gestation period for startups that are using you know, uh, machine learning or AI because they need to get data and then train their algorithm and models. So I think we are getting a lot better when it comes to startups that are using AI. We actually have real usage of AI that we are seeing with some of our applicant pool. Um, so yeah, so, so that's on the AI front. Uh, the trends that are you you're really seeing standing out. Yeah, so in terms of trends, like um, we look at uh, our applicants completely sector agnostic. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. But given the fact that we are looking at AI and deep learning, we do see healthcare, agri tech, and fintech. Mm -hmm. uh, these three areas, the application of AI and ML tends to be it's more ripe for application, and we see a lot of startups now actually uh, owning the AI and ML component and doing very well as they get more and more data. Got it. Last, lastly, what's been uh, uh, what's been Google's learning from sort of engaging with startups? Uh, you've uh, been at the Launchpad for over four years now. What has really been Google India's learning from the entire experience? I mean, it's really about how can we make sure the ecosystem supports itself. Mm -hmm. And when I look at the mentors pool that we've been able to build and our 
entire alumni pool, uh, this has become like an amazing community that kind of powers itself as we go forward. We've had examples of a lot of alumni coming back as mentors and a lot of our mentors becoming investors in the startups and so on. So I think the power of community and the power of mentorship is now being unlocked after like few years. And uh, this is really going to grow strongly. Uh, and we hope that more and more really strong startups are part of this by applying to the program and join us in this journey to grow the ecosystem and that we can all really look to truly solve for India. Excellent. Thank you so much. Wonderful chatting with you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks. Well, uh, there you go. That's uh, Google India and its plans for the accelerator program. What exactly is looking for and how it wants to uh, really help out the women entrepreneurs. He, uh, you know, even gave us that email address. And uh, if you missed it or if you want to catch parts of it again, this uh, segment will be on YouTube too. While we're talking about our uh, Google segment, we're going to put the spotlight on the women entrepreneur and their journey so far with Google. Here's Rahul Dhyama having a chop pile of sorts uh, with these women entrepreneurs. Well, yes, I'm here at the Google Launchpad for women entrepreneurs, and uh, I decided to sort of sit down with women entrepreneurs, women in tech, sort of. Uh, out there solving challenges, building their own startups, their businesses, to understand where have we really come as far as the narrative around women entrepreneurs is concerned. Uh, there is, of course, a poor representation of women in the workforce. Is that the case in tech? Why don't we talk about it often? To decode all of that, uh, I have with me women entrepreneurs. Uh, mind you, from across the country, they're not only here from India. Thank you all so much for taking out uh, the time and joining us on ET Now. Uh, Firstly, tell us what has your broad takeaway really been from the Google program so far and uh, how has it sort of helped you in your journey? Sure. Um, so I'm Kushbu Agarwal. I represent the startup called Sila Health. We are based out of Gurgaon. I think uh, technology is going to play a big role in, in the way the world is shaping up, uh, solving India's problems ground up. And we've taken the approach to solve this for healthcare, specifically for chronic patients who are dealing a difficult life at home trying to uh, you know, beat the stress of their disease or not being able to control their blood sugar or BP levels, for example, and ending up with complications. I would say a platform like this is really, really helpful um, for, for women who have taken uh, the larger role of handling family alongside work and uh, really you know, leading a team. Um, and it helps us connect with the right individuals um, and you know, seek the mentorship that we require to really uh, go and succeed in what we've set out for. Got it. Uh, coming to you, uh, I, I, she touched upon a crucial point of the need for networking, right? There yes. are not many opportunities uh, to be networking. Of course, there are events, there are groups that you can reach out. But for women entrepreneurs who you know, are sort of battling with the same journey, the same issues, it's interesting to have that networking effect really. Yes, hi, I'm Mansi. I am from uh, Mindchamp. My uh, company is more about teaching computer coding to kids and uh, oh, wow. good that you brought up this topic because uh, ours is a women-only company. Mm. So networking is something that uh, we really look forward to. Uh, we actually look forward to every day. So uh, given Google Launchpad, Google as such is a huge platform for you know anybody. So when we had heard about it, it was our first reaction to apply on it uh, at that particular point of time. And uh, it, was, it is a wonderful platform. They are uh, taking us through how us as women can together come together and help each other out so that we can reach at a higher level than what we are looking forward to. But networking, as you said, is really key in that. You know, I want to ask you, uh, uh, and you know, forgive me if I'm wrong, but are women also guilty of not really asking enough and standing up for opportunities? Uh, you, you know, some of them feel we're not ready for it right now. Maybe this is not for me. Let me achieve some sort of a scale. Uh, do we really, uh, do women really uh, ask less than what they really deserve? Um, I think sometimes women are women's own enemies. Uh, we do uh, wait for you know achieving certain milestones which maybe someone else would not. Um, we, you know, I think it's a function of a lot of cultural conditioning as well. But I think uh, programs like these, like Google uh, Launchpad, will help you sort of find kindred souls and connect with each other to you know find a solution. Got it. Yeah. Uh Tech itself, you know, we're discussing uh, representation of women in tech. We don't talk about it a lot more often. While it may be in a percentage terms a lot 
you know it's still a man's world so to say but uh, is it important that there are changes that are really panning out i know you'd want to add also that a lot more women are now sort of taking up uh, uh, interesting challenging roles as far as technology is concerned um certainly yes short answer yes uh, my name is sanskruti i'm from thinkabell labs we're building the world's first uh, and largest e-learning platform for the visually impaired starting with eliminating braille illiteracy so uh, personally i developed technology that uh, helps blind children learn braille by themselves now since um, uh, accessibility and inclusion is mostly a government domain in india mm, mm. Uh, me being a woman in tech that has developed my own product i've been faced with you know shock mm. and saying you know which which american company are you representing are you an agent are mm. you and and it's, it's just so much disbelief that people they can't believe that uh, i designed and created this product mm -hmm. but the flip side to it is also that when i do establish my credentials and i uh, establish my authority on the subject i know and i know my stuff inside out uh, people are much more willing to bet on me mm -hmm. to give me a chance mm -hmm. so yes what you're saying is true there it is still a man's world mm -hmm. which gives all women a distinct advantage because if you're visible in a man's world people are going to say hey you know what you you've come here and you've done this thing mm -hmm. uh you're already more impressive than all the other men mm -hmm. in the room mm -hmm. so i i think it's it's a double edged sword right yeah but i i like the positivity to it really you want know, to add to that and also we're discussing uh, has the entire notion around investors we see uh, for women entrepreneurs also changed the cliched idea being how much time are you going to be dedicating to the startup would you be giving it enough while you go about managing other responsibilities Sure, absolutely. Um, I I do think it is changing in a great way. In fact, I would like to talk about the one session we had uh, earlier in the event, where you know there was a question about do we think there is a glass ceiling? Mm. It was actually very heartening to see that a lot of us believe that it doesn't exist or it's actually you know no uh, it's actually no longer going to be there uh, in in the future. So I think that's very very positive. In fact, I do feel that investors want to look. for companies where there is diversity because there's also a lot of research that shows that the more diverse a company is in terms of representation not just for gender but mm. for all other forms mm. of diversity mm. the more mm. uh, i would say successful a company can get uh, in its journey and i think that's very very happening definitely or right, anyone wants to add is there a constant uh, uh, you know interest in sort of ensuring that you do go about also hiring a lot many women in the company or 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 is that again a very cliched way of looking at that women entrepreneurs should idly would idly hire women in right um i think we've been very lucky um i would say 80% of my 26 member team today is women i'm very 80%? proud of that oh. uh it is a very staggering fact for most but uh the reason they are there and they are performing superbly well is because that as women we have the empathy for healthcare that's required uh, of course i have men mm -hmm. in the team who are doing well as well mm -hmm. but i think the skill match and the eq match is crucial in the industry where i am i am right now uh, and add to it the discipline and hard work that women bring in i'm a huge fan of women um, and uh, i don't want to be biased but whenever i go and hire i end up hiring more women than men and it's kind of a joke in my team but uh, it is what it is and we're doing superbly well i guess all right Uh, yeah you want to activate and also you know we were discussing uh, about the balancing act you know uh, is it a lot more tough to be giving we have of course heard stories about indra nui you know when she went home after a massive promotion i think she said that you're the boss outside the house but inside you know you will still have to sort of take care of responsibilities uh, and of course you spoke about glass ceiling that does not exist but have things really changed or is that really a tough balancing act while you go about building these startups there's additional pressure to also you know be a perfect balance at home and work yes work life balance is a real thing and uh, uh, as i already mentioned that we work with women who have taken a career break and most of these women have taken a career break because you know usually it's mostly due to maternity so getting these women back to work because they have an entire difference in priority and it is a very crucial factor and when we see that happen that uh, these women are actually balancing their work at the same time it is a added responsibility for them whereas i have seen that uh, when i work with my colleagues uh, who are uh, men for them they don't need to think twice when they have to wait back after work whereas women have that additional responsibility mm -hmm. even while coming to bangalore one mm -hmm. of my colleagues she had to 
call up her parents she had to call up her husband that okay should i will the will you be able to manage the kids etc mm-hmm. etc yeah. a man will never think twice before taking that decision that that, so, that will take yes. a long long time to sort yes. of change on ground anything you want to add to the entire conversation um, really um i i i agree with what she said the only thing i want to add is take all the help that you get and ask for all the help that uh, that is offered to you um i th- i think that's something that we forget all the time um i i also think i forgot to introduce myself at the beginning <laughs> <laughs> i'm actually i'm founder of the nestry uh, we're actually a platform for uh, curated sustainable children's products and uh, and and a content discovery platform for you know evidence based information so that parents can chart their own journey yeah, yeah. so that's i'm glad you sort of uh, pitched in at the right time but uh, tell me something what message would you want to give to women out there in colleges uh, who want to start who want to be entrepreneurs from your journey is that a very important factor when i meet women entrepreneurs it's about let's keep the guilt away i think it's guilt that sort of takes half of uh, you know the focus Oh wow that's that's a very special question to me because I start my company right out of college. <laughs> so I will say to women that are still in colleges this is the best time to start a company because uh it's it's when you know you're not as clouded with society's expectation of you as a as a woman you're more a student than anything else and there's so much there's infinite opportunity and you can you can chart your own course with respect to you know even work life balance how much of that you want to take on at what stage uh Personally, I would say college is really an amazing time. Few women in technology who have been mentored by none other than Google. With that, we'll take a short commercial break. But stay tuned. We've got a real special lineup for you on the other side. It's the world's largest instant messaging service, WhatsApp. The global chief in India talks about payment plans. Talks about mentoring startups, uh, businesses that all of you can do on WhatsApp. That special conversation coming up after the short break. Welcome back. You're watching the brand new Startup Central with me, Nantara Rai. Now we're going to get you a big voice. It's the global chief of WhatsApp, the world's largest instant messaging service. Of course, its owner Facebook has been in the news for all the wrong reasons since yesterday, uh, on account of that five billion dollar payment uh, penalty settlement uh, in the United States. But WhatsApp, the largest instant messaging service, has big plans for India, not just for social networking or for what you and I might be messaging, but when it comes to serious business. Remember, they want to be in the payments business, but they also want to in- enable startups. self-employed business people to use WhatsApp more to be use the social commerce uh, feature a lot more. Well, here's the global chief talking about that and a lot more. One of the things we've seen that's so amazing is how WhatsApp has expanded to really help people connect with businesses, not just their family. How much so much of your life, your economic activity is now happening on WhatsApp. Um so whether it's a startup vying for the next big idea or local markets, you know, someone running a shop WhatsApp is playing a role. This week in Mumbai, I was lucky enough to get to go around Crawford Market and just stall after stall I saw sharp shopkeepers using WhatsApp to sell their goods across India. People would say, "Okay, someone comes through the market, they meet me, become a customer, but then I build a relationship with them. I follow up with them over time, they repeat orders." I also was lucky enough in this photo here, I met a new generation of entrepreneurs that innovate. There's so much energy and optimism happening here in India, and we're so humbled to be a small part of it. We're going to hear some great stories today. I wanted to mention one. Here's a here's a great story of Arti from Bangalore. She started an all-natural ice cream business last year. Arti happens to have a hearing disability and WhatsApp helps her communicate fast with customers and partners in a way where they can understand each other quickly. She used WhatsApp to launch a special limited edition of healthier ice creams and I hear sold out. Very exciting. And now you have 14 people on staff, expanded to five locations and two more in plan. Unbelievable. Congratulations. We're hearing amazing stories like this every day. Farmers, micro businesses, entrepreneurs. These are the people who are providing the majority of jobs and driving economic growth. And we're excited to be playing a role. Our next step is to provide payments to all of our users. We've built payments based on the UPI standard, partnering with banks here in India. And the idea is we want it to be as easy for someone to send money to someone else through WhatsApp as it is today to send a message. 
We believe that if we get this right, it will accelerate financial inclusion and bring millions more people into India's fast-growing digital economy. We can't wait to provide this service to more of our users all across India later this year. And as we grow, we'll continue to invest in digital skills so people can make the most of tech. Later today, we'll be running our pilots of our new enhanced WhatsApp training modules with all of you here. And we're planning to work more with civil society and government to figure this out. Over the next year, we plan to provide WhatsApp business training seminars across the country to members of Niti Aayog's Women Entrepreneurship Platform, provide $100,000 to the winners of the Women Transforming India Awards, an annual contest by Niti Aayog for women breaking the glass ceiling, and conduct webinars and on-the-ground trainings for WhatsApp business. We want the world to see how India is a gateway to a billion opportunities. Well, there you go. That's the WhatsApp Global Chief in New Delhi. Before that, he was in Mumbai visiting Crawford Market, uh, where he saw how successful WhatsApp has been for social commerce to take off uh, for small entrepreneurs. And in fact, uh, them at that event where the Global Chief was, my colleague Parisha Tyagi came across a student from IIT, or I should say had graduated from IIT, worked briefly with Xiaomi, with Flipkart, but now is pursuing his dream Thanks to WhatsApp, he's selling comics. He's designing them, writing them, and selling them. Here's that special story. When I was actually growing up, I was a huge comics fan. In fact, my father had been a very big comics fan. He used to collect a lot of Phantom and Mandrake comics in his times. And uh, when I was growing up, he used to bring me any comic, Chacha Chaudhary, Nagraj, Batman, Superman, anything. And uh, grew up learning those, uh, falling, falling in love with those. But uh, when I went to college in IIT Roorkee, not much was happening in comics, you know. At the railway stations, you would not see comics anymore. After uh, IIT, I joined Flipkart and uh, the business was going even down. I tried contacting a lot of founders of comic companies in India, but felt various problems. One, uh, they were still stuck with the age-old distribution method. They were not innovating with the times and uh, definitely not going digital. So when, uh, so I first thought, okay, let me try as a as a comic, as a hobby. So I was working with Xiaomi at that time. I'd quit Flipkart, joined Xiaomi. And I launched uh, Ved, which was our first comic book. Uh, it was a journey of a Delhi-based detective who is using just his wit and skills to solve cases. And we launched this in July 2016. I didn't know how to write. I contacted on uh, Facebook one of my friends. She, uh, she was very good at drawing, so she drew it. And we together launched this comic book. Then we got another contract from Balaji Motion Pictures. Uh, Flying Jet movie was coming out, Tiger Shroff, Jacqueline Fernandez. And uh, when this happened, we thought, you know, uh, there's so much interest we are getting also from the industry. And uh, we soon got a contract from Ajay Devgan Films. We did a comic for Shivai. And then with, that's when it's like, if we can do so many things for as a service for companies, possibly we can do stuff for our own as well. And we launched around eight superheroes now. So Ved was your first comics, you've also Flying Jet was also taken for, up for a movie. But which is the most popular one, which is the most sold comic of all these? Uh, it has been Karma for us. Uh, this was our first Hindi language experiment as well. In fact, Karma is now licensed by Dainik Bhaskar. Uh, it gets printed in, a, in their daily uh, newspaper in MP certain regions. So uh, Karma is a very interesting character. There are some characters like Superman, Batman who capture the criminal and hand them to the police. Then there are characters like Punisher who kill the criminals. Karma lies in between. What goes around comes around. So if someone steals something from someone, Karma will steal something from him and make him realize the mistake. Okay, so Karma lets Karma take care of all yeah, yeah. the evil in the world. Yeah. So how do you use WhatsApp to promote your products? How do you uh, tap your consumer base over WhatsApp? So uh, WhatsApp uh, is, is very interesting because of two reasons. One, it helps you get in touch with your customer because everyone has a WhatsApp. So even uh, people who visit us at stalls, at Comic Con events or be it at some startup expo or any of the events, uh, even we do comic community meetups at different cities. We did one in Indore, Jabalpur, so many places. Uh, whoever comes, we ask them, hey, would you like to try our comics? They would say yes, we'll ask them for a WhatsApp number. It's the easiest way to start a conversation, let them know of your comics. Once they try your comic for a month, they, they most likely uh, will tend to subscribe, that's one. The second uh, very interesting way of using WhatsApp is to get feedbacks because uh, in, in, if you sell this comic you know, at a railway station stall, you wouldn't know if the customer has really liked it and he there is no way he can come and tell you his feedback, he'll have to go to find your Facebook page and this 
tons of difficulties in that but on a whatsapp it's very easy he reads the comic he likes it or dislikes it it's directly in a whatsapp message to you so you can keep on improving iterating understanding what customer is liking not liking and change your course with it well, there you go there's just one example of someone who graduated from iit worked at shami worked at flipkart and is now able to pursue his dreams of selling comics only on whatsapp with that it's a wrap my thanks for watching